Yale University, we reviewed a number of papers, and I'm absolutely delighted to host this panel on the use of natural language processing applied to sustainable finance. You will hear from our three panelists here um, about how they have conducted their research independently, but have settled on the same key topic, which is where are the blind spots of climate finance data? So you will hear from Shadi Fede from Vanguard uh, on applying natural language processing to understand anomalies between climate risk incurred by corporations and the risk management actions taken by those companies. You will hear from Andres, uh, Andres Alonso from the Bank of Spain about applying natural language processing to identify the blind spots of research. Where do we need more research to take action on climate finance? And you will hear from our friend Sebastian Tidman from Syracuse University on applying natural language processing to understand better how capital markets interpret statements made on emerging issues in sustainable finance to bring more capital to sustainable finance. So all of our three panelists are going to tackle the topic of blind spots from a different angle. And I hope this will help you think about questions to ask them. So the way we're going to do this is I am going to introduce our three panelists and they are going to give you a 10 minute presentation on their research. Then we will have panel questions. Uh, this is a small audience, so feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. Um, this will be very valuable. So our first panelist is Shadi Fade from Vanguard. Um, Shadi is a senior um, analyst at Vanguard. She has been studying physics and data science. She is currently working in the investment management fintech strategies team of Vanguard. She is very passionate on the topic. You're going to hear that today. She conducted her research with Professor Court, who is here and will help answer any questions you have on uh, her first presentation. So is this, Shadi, over to you. Thank you, Corinne. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, um, Shadi. I will start the presentation that uh, on a project that I worked with Todd Court on trying to use NLP to find um, linkages between uh, management quality in um, companies and climate change risks. So um, to start, we know that material risks like climate risk um, can manifest as financial impact whose magnitude depends on the exposure of the company and the ability of the company to mitigate these risks. Now, Professor Court found in his previous paper that management quality of companies significantly influences their ESG performance. However, current data and metrics um, are not sufficient in capturing quality of management. We find that ge they're generally uh, based on historical performance, so not forward-looking, um, they have limited transparency, so limited verifiability, and they generally cast broad assessments um, that tends to oversimplify a lot of material issues. So we want to see if we can generate the data to look at quality of management and identify these relationships and linkages using NLP. So let's start with an example. We know that uh, climate change impacts such as heat interact with company operations through exposures. So an exposure to heat could be wildfires. Now the mechanisms by which these exposure events um, interact with business operations is what we call internalization pathways. So in this case of wildfires, disruption of power generation is an example of an internalization that if not mitigated could have financial impacts in this case in the form of power outages. So this is very important for understanding the background in our research. Now these internalizations, these mechanisms are what we think we should look at. However, these internalizations depend on a lot of factors from sector to region to area of operations and there is not a lot of data about them. 
So let's see how we can understand how to find this linkage, linkage um, algorithmically. So let's take a step back and redefine internalization pathways as a sequence of causal events, such as greenhouse gas emissions, that if not controlled, could be internalized as climate risk. So for example here, the regulated cost on carbon emissions is an example of an internalization pathway that if not mitigated could have financial implications. So here we see that the basis of our research has deals with three high level <coughs> topics or themes. We have climate related themes and financial related themes. And in the middle, we have these internalization pathways that we think we need to look at the quality of management to understand. So now, these internalization pathways in the middle are actually our hidden variables that we're trying to find. Climate and financial kind of related themes is what we observe, the observable, and internalization pathways are the hidden variable. And we want to look at the quality of management to find them. Now, we believe in order to quantify this relationship, if a discussion or a section of a document has topics, has intersecting themes of interest, meaning the climate themes and management themes co-occur, that increases the likelihood that we find those hidden variables, the internalization pathways. So we try to find discussions that have intersecting themes of interest to find internalization pathways. Now, as I said, we don't have data about internalization pathways. So we believe that we need to generate this data. And if we provide empirical examples of where these climate um, risk internalization pathways exist in companies, then we can, by identifying what we mean in text, we can try to understand and identify that quantitatively. So we find 51 documents from a set of 26 companies that have this internalization in place. And then in order to find those three topics that I said we're interested in, we try to represent our documents in different levels of abstraction to find those topics. And then we try to identify that behavior. So there are multiple ways that we can find topics in our documents. Um, the first approach is that we create a manual dictionary that finds these climate change impacts, their exposures and internalization pathways, and we manually find examples of these internalization pathways in our documents. So now we have a manual dictionary that links these concepts. And the first and simplest approach is to find exact matches to this dictionary to find internalization pathways. However, this approach is quite manual. The dictionary is very rigid, um, with limited ability to improve, and this exact matching creates a lot of false positives. So we move on to a more scalable approach. This is a very widely used method in the industry, finding topic modeling, for example, using latent Dirichlet allocation. I won't discuss it in detail, but in this way, to sum it up, we try to abstract or represent words as numbers, and then to find, based on the importance and weight of these words, the important topics. However, this approach is also has limited capability because we need a lot of data to be able to train these topic models and find meaningful topics. And also, it's limited in capturing context and semantic relationships. So we move on to the third approach that is our focus for today, which is a thematic representation, meaning the abstraction of these terms or dictionary to themes. Now, these themes, the, we do this by using a knowledge graph. It's called ANVIL. Now, this knowledge graph is already has been trained on a lot of documents throughout the years and is able to identify entities and companies and so on and the relationships. So if we can find the themes in our documents, we're able to see the important topics and themes, the associated words, and where our documents sit in this knowledge graph. 
So a theme in a knowledge graph is a node in the knowledge graph is a connected set of multiple entities. So how do we do this? Imagine that we have a document and we pass that through our knowledge graph. So for example, we have a word storm in one of our documents. After passing through the knowledge graph, we see that this word is actually under a theme called climate change in our knowledge graph. So by finding this theme, we find all other associated words and terms to storm. So for example, thunderstorms and blizzards. But also, we find words like droughts and GHG emissions that we never encountered in our data set. So this is very important because we were able to scale up our dictionary and increase the scope of what we think we should care about. So by this, we have found the themes in our documents and there are multiple themes that sit in the themes that we're interested in. So we group them into three broad categories of climate, management, and financial themes. Now, after finding these themes in our documents, I have to see how can I algorithmically find internalization pathways. We can use coordinates of these themes that let us know what part of the document is associated with the theme to find sections of documents where the coordinates of themes intersect, meaning to find sections of documents where multiple themes of interest to us are present and co-occurring. And then we start generating a labeled data set. The sections that have co-occurring themes of interest as lab are labeled as true, meaning they have a potential internalization pathway and a zero otherwise. After having created this labeled data set that I presented here in the cases that it could be a true, we would take as prior that we have discussions of climate, then we want to find discussions that relate to management or financial implications to those climate risks. After having generated this label, uh, label data set, we can now try to build classification models with the objective of finding sections of the document that have potential internalization pathways. Now we train these models and they seem to be doing well, but I think the best way of seeing what they do is to show you an empirical example. So here is an example of a section uh, from one of the reports from Anglo-American uh, company, that's a metals and mining company, and this section was identified as a true label. So let's see what this is talking about. This uh, is talking about the board uh, approved acquisition of a specific company that is in line with the portfolio trajectory of Anglo-American for a low carbon footprint. So in red, we have financial related themes that I've highlighted in green, some climate related themes. And we see that we have been able to identify an internalization pathway and the board and management decisions around that internalization pathway. Here we're talking about this project that um, finds a specific um, mineral fertilizer that has a low carbon footprint and certified for organic use. So we actually also can use this information to find better approaches for other companies in the sector. So researchers can reverse engineer what we find about these best practices to find these examples of internalizations and potential climate risks. So um, to conclude here, uh, I, don't, I wanna spare you all the technical details, but I think it's very important to can note that we identified that there's a gap in ESG data and metrics in looking at quality of management. And we believe that um, these internalizations that we find are a sequence of events that are complicated, that are not observable and obvious, and they depend on sector, region, the types of communities that are involved in those operations. And these internalizations and climate risks are always changing and evolving. So our understanding has to evolve with these. So we believe that having frameworks for understanding ESG performance and metrics is very important, but to have an ever evolving understanding of how companies interact with these climate risks 
we think we should use these NLP methods that go hand in hand to complement more traditional metrics. And um, I think it's very important to understand that these internalizations are specific to companies, specific to operations, and this type of understanding of the operations, not only that have to do with climate-related products, but in all areas of operations is required. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure you will have lots of questions for Shadi in a minute. Uh, so our second speaker is Andres Alonso. Andres is a senior economist at the Financial Innovation Division at the Central Bank of Spain. He has a lot of experience in treasury and capital markets, spent 10 years in that space, and he's now focusing on machine learning applications and new trends in climate finance. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne, for having me here. Um, and actually, as I was telling some of you before, I think that part of my mission has already been fulfilled by the previous speech, the opening speech, because I'm going to talk about so many things that I've encountered the number of times that the presenter said, like fragmentation of the topic and how technology can help here. So I think fragmentation was mentioned like six times and technology like five times, something like that. Um, so I, I will just put some evidence, some support, some empirical evidence of how technology is needed by climate finance to scale up. Okay, so this is a, a literature review that we did in the Bank of Spain, the Central Bank of Spain, together with two co-authors, that is Jose Manuel Carbo and Jose Manuel Marquez. And um, I usually present this work in two different audiences, either uh, pure engineers, machine learning experts, or economists that are trying to go into climate. So depending on which one I'm presenting, I put one first slide motivating why we need technology or why climate is important. So I think that here we all know that climate is important, it's material, but we might think, you know, why machine learning? Is this a hype or not? So I, I, I want to put this example because it's quite visual and because it's, um, it's, it's not uh, ranging all the scope of the potential of machine learning, but we need to understand that climate finance itself has a problem in its heart, in its core, this is the tragedy of the horizon that we have never seen climate uh, change happening. So we need to convince people. And I think that one of the previous CEOs also said this as opening our minds. So we need to change not only the stock, but the flow, what we say in financial markets. We need to change all these brown assets into green assets, but we also need to convince people. We need to change the mind of the people and we need to change the consumer's behavior and the client's behavior. So how can we do that if they haven't seen this before? So uh, some of you might know these uh, deep fakes that are basically adversarial uh, neural networks. And we need uh, some, some ways to convince the people that, you know, this, is, this might happen in your location. So in the last conference of the parts, uh, the one in Glasgow, the AI Quebec Institute, I put here also the, the link if you, if you are interested in it, just created this thing. They created a deep fake using guns to pinpoint any location in the map so that you can simulate what can happen here regarding a flood or a heat wave or so many other things. So I put here the, uh, our location today to see, you know, you can visualize, you can see that we, can, we, we need to bypass the cognitive biases of I've never experienced this before, we have this myopic discount thing of cognitive biases, you know, I think the future will never happen and we might need technology to assist us on these things. So it's very visual, but I think that it's, it's to transmit the message that we need some help. We need some help because uh, the commitments by the politicians are there, because the supervision, uh, supervisory authorities are already committed to fulfilling the task of going into climate finance as mainstreams, but we have a lot of evidence, evidence that uh, there are methodological constraints and data constraints that really prevented previous researchers to create more support and evidence and work on climate finance. I'm talking about non-linearities, endogeneity, I'm talking about big data, access to different kinds of data and structured data that really with the traditional econometrics was not easy to handle. But together with the commitment of the regulators, we are already working in our innovation hubs to try to see the potential of AI and machine learning to assist us on some operational problems of green finance. We are talking a lot of times about data, I'm also talking about connecting little investors with the funding projects. And also we are talking about how to measure climate risks. So we from supervisory authorities are already working on how to use AI and machine learning. When we talk about innovation hub, and this is one of the big messages I want to convey here, we are not only talking about 
blockchain, cybersecurity, crypto, stable coins. We are also talking about green finance, and, I, and we are also talking about how to use new technologies for green finance, because this has to be the new mainstream. So for a better policy uh, design of the instruments, we need to go faster. We need to shorten the time frame of how uh, can we really understand all the uh, issues regarding green finance for the banks to commit on this, uh, on this pathway. So we need uh, some research to really uh, understand what the uh, machine learning experts and computer scientists uh, can assist us on here. So that's why we did our literature review, trying to fulfill this gap. Basically, um, I, I use topic modeling that you uh, mentioned it before, because in our case, we were able to gather a, a larger corpus of documents. And what it was interesting from our side was to see you know, how multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary the work is here. Uh, and this is one of the big uh, challenges here. When we're talking about climate, we are talking about environmental journals, we are talking about computer science journals, and we're talking about economic journals. So we, we come with the idea of putting some objectivity on the table. You know, sustainable finance is very fragmented. Anything can be green finance, carbon finance, sustainable finance, impact investment. But we wanted to put some clear definition of what we are looking for. And we restricted ourselves to climate change, to climate finance, climate change in financial markets. So we did this uh, Latin direct allocation model to really try to uncover what are the topics of the people doing research, trying to solve problems in climate finance, but using machine learning itself. So it's, it's a subsample. It's, I, I, I'm only interested on what machine, learners, uh, machine learning experts know and are applying it to climate finance. So basically the LDA model, I won't spend more than a minute here, but what we are trying to use here, the natural language processing is try not to put anything from our side, uh, any prior knowledge of what we think is climate finance, and basically just try to decompose our corpus of documents into vectors, one of tokens that are the keywords, another of um, topics that are the thematic areas, and how important are the tokens by the vectors to define the corpus. So uh, we use uh, the best uh, available resources to solve this kind of problems. And there is a kind of trade-off because usually we want to see very simple documents to really understand what is behind it. But to see simple documents, we have to add a lot of words. So it's not that easy. There is a trade-off and we solving that. We find uh, at the end up to 10 topics that the machine understood that the people are uh, investigating in climate finance using machine learning. But from these 10 topics, not everything the machine finds, it's human understandable. So we try to label a posteriori ourselves. And we found up to seven topics that made sense for us as climate finance experts. Uh, I just put here one example of kind of the output of our model. Um, so in order to put, you know, what, what is important here for us, this would be like energy economics. I'm sorry because it's too small, but we find things like energy, prediction, forecasting, buildings, efficiency. So we are clear that we are talking about energy economics. For that, we use uh, some other metric like relevance, coherence, etc. Uh, happy to discuss about that later, but it's quite robust. So we find that some key findings that we think that might help future researchers to really dig deeper into uh, what we need in climate finance. First, uh, machine learning starts to be all over the place. If we go into other literature reviews of sustainable finance as a whole, we match our topics with those other studies and basically in 70, 80% of the cases, we found some work using machine learning in those topics. We didn't find in some topics like stress testing or green banks or something like that, but it's a start to be mainstream, the use of, main, of machine learning. So that's a very positive news from our side, I think, you know, from our side. Second thing is uh, this, there is a clear time series pattern. You know, some topics are new, some topics are old. Um, physical risk and energy economics are topics that have been studied for a long time. However, there are some new topics that are emerging. And one of them is a very good example, Vanguard, is climate data. Uh, climate data, ESG factors, uh, responsible investment is very new. And, it, and the, the research exploded after 2015 with the uh, Paris Agreement, makes sense. So we are delivering, but also it's important to see that there were some other topics that actually were more mature. So when you go into physical risk and when you go into energy economics, you see a lot of peer-reviewed papers. However, in ESG factors and climate data, there is a lot of potential because everything is in working format. So it's now the moment to work on these topics. It's not that much published. 
is starting to be published right now, so it's a big opportunity for future researchers that actually already know uh, so much machine learning, and they, they want to use their skills for something, so our advice there, try to go to some of these emerging areas. Um, then, uh, machine learning is bringing new topic itself, and, what, and the, the very best example is climate data. Climate data has never been found as a topic in any other literature review, but when you go into machine learning, actually there are so many people using NLP for climate data. They are using transformers, topic modeling, they are using Google Bird, they are using a lot of things actually to improve the quality of the data. So thanks to machine learning, this is a very good example of how can we accelerate the regulation that I also mentioned at the beginning in the first speech. We need a regulation that do really go along, but we need something to shorten the time until the regulation is here. So I, IFRS will come here, but we do not have that time. So we need NLP to people to start doing something, to start doing investment, to start you know, tilting their portfolios toward the good direction. So here NLP, it's key. Um, and then a, a message that we feel that we are aligned with the ECB is that we are talking uh, climate finance. We're talking about how integrated is climate change for banks and financial institutions and in academics from economic journals. And it's quite heterogeneous, it's quite uh, polarized. We find so low interest from economic journals on uh, physical risks using machine learning. But this is interesting because it's something that also the ECB found that in the last uh, report um, looking for the results of the survey on, on how banks are inter internalizing uh, climate risk, they saw a concern and they raised a concern that they are more aware or more putting more efforts in transition risk more than physical risk. And might make sense because transition risk is regulatory risk and for economists we are used to regulatory risk, but physical risk is a new knowledge domain. So you need environmentalists and you need new kind of skills from new people and the concern is like physical risk is as important at least as transition risk so we put, should put more work on that, more work from economic journals and from economists to work with something that maybe we are not as comfortable <coughs> as with other areas. And finally, because I'm talking about machine learning, this is also very much aligned with other, with other research, but we always think that we should go for the most complex algorithm to find a big improvement. It's not the case. We, don't, we do not need to go for deep, deep neural networks. Sometimes something in between works very well, random forest, gradient boosting, some other kind of instruments here work much better and are highly used by researchers. So that's good news. And also, it's interesting because in some of the topics we find, for example, those uh, with the regulators behind them, I mean, responsible markets uh, and ESG factors, or because the transparency is required, people are starting to use causal machine learning and explainable machine learning, these new techniques that comes together with the models. Uh, and we find this very also interesting and positive because it's, uh, again, evolution in, the, in this area of machine learning. But not everything is positive in the sense that machine learning is not magic. So when, when the data is not of high quality data, when the data is not granular enough, when the data is not complete enough, machine learning cannot do magic. I have in my mind a very good paper trying to estimate the scope three data from carbon emissions and you cannot do much better than linear models trying to impute missing data, even using very complex transform, uh, transformer models. So you, you have to go one step back and try to use the technology not to improve bad quality data, but to collect be better data. So that's a very um, uh, policy suggestion that we are also putting in the paper. And finally, there is also a trade-off in machine learning itself. This might be a very ener energy-consuming uh, activity, so there is a lot of future research, and actually it's happening as of today on green AI, on, on a responsible use of the programming of this algorithm. So there is also a lot of uh, things happening there that I wanted to point out. Thank you. So our last speaker is uh, Sebastian Tidman. Sebastian is assistant professor in accounting at Syracuse University. I'm sure you picked up on your commentary regarding ISSB. And um, Sebastian holds a PhD in accounting from the University of Bremen in Germany. His research is on the intersection of financial accounting and ESG, and uh, often involves textual analysis. Some of his work actually is focusing on verbal aggressiveness, uh, on learning schools, and I highly recommend those uh, papers. 
So Sebastian, if you're ready, yes. over to you. Just, that's great. Thank you so much, Nathan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's my pleasure to be here, and thank you so much, Corinne, for moderating the session, uh, Nathan and Todd for, for organizing. It's been a very uh, interesting session so far, and I am actually quite delighted about the overlap that we have, which, from reading the abstract, I felt like there is definitely an overlap, which is natural language processing, but there is there's so much more. And I like let me just perhaps just already like giving you some context on the study where I think there is there's some importance overlap. First, like with um, the the presentation of, of Andres, really like the, the way how he motivated is there is a cognitive bias out there that we're not like as human beings good enough good enough at predicting or incorporating the future, like, what, like the future fe feels far away. If something we can't really measure, if we can't really get it, we, we are reluctant to change. So this paper is really about can we get the capital market, can we get investors on board for that change? And there's a lot of research, I'll talk about that in a bit, that it's so important to get investors on board because oftentimes when there's technology change, investors are often the ones that rather focus on the short term and actually stop companies from changing for their own good. So that's, that's a really nice overlap. And then uh, for Shady and Todd, I really, really like the, um, the, the way how you um, talk about really management as this, the core, core factor in that whole um, natural language um, position of um, them, them being the ones that actually sort of like need to moderate what's happening out there versus how it affects them internally. So um, again, like here, this, this paper really looking into the management on the hot seat, because this is a study that looks at earnings conference calls. So where managers put themselves out there and talk about sustainability, talk about other things as well, talk about obviously the financial performance, but to an increasing extent also about sustainability. And we look at how they frame it. How would they talk about sustainability, particularly we focus on environmental sustainability because uh, we think that's the most important topic that companies have picked up in their communication within earnings conference calls. And um, the study is co-authored with Jörn Hopmann, Kerstin Opata, and Thomas Tammen. Um, and we, we, together, we, um, so now I have a, an issue because this one here does, oh yeah, no, really. Okay, so, so what, what I want to do is uh, three things, really talk about quickly about theory, like what, what's, why, why, is, why, why is it important, um, show you data methods. I, I'm glad I kept the, the data and the method section short because you've you done an amazing job at, at showing why natural language processing is important, so I'll only have a, a few sentences to say on that, and then I'll show you the, the results, so what do we find? So first of all, really, really connecting to, to Anna's uh, notion, there is a cognitive bias, there is a, an issue within organizations. Firms need to change, and firms are basically aware of the need to change. There's a consensus. They need to adopt. They need to adjust to, con to the environment. And still, a lot of firms are not changing, are not changing quickly enough, although they should know better. And there's a big literature on organization inertia, and they inf identify external <laughs> stakeholders, such as investors, such as analysts, who actually be the ones that actually contribute to a, a slower pace of change, again, harming them themselves. But here's the good news. Companies can do something about it. And a key tool, what they can use, particularly when we talk about like the discussion and also uh, what you said in the beginning, um, uh, Shadi, about the, the lack of ESG data, investors and analysts look out for clues. What are companies saying? What do they put out there with, with their language, with their, with their text, with their, the way how they frame things? And there is some literature already out there that sell side analysts do incorporate language into the way how they um, analyze companies. But we, we know very little about how the capital markets, how investors, we ultimately, we, we really care about as, as the owners, how they would uh, react to that. So, so then the, the key question we want to ask in that, that study is how does managers uh, framing of emerging strategic issues, yeah, so specifically environmental sustainability, um, shape the response by external um, stakeholders, yeah, so by the capital market. And we have four hypotheses that really look at the framing of of managers. The first one is, is a very simple question of, does it help or harm to raise awareness of there is an issue? There's an issue, we need to change. We need to do something about our impact on the environment. Is that a good or a bad thing? And unfortunately, there's a lot of research already out there that shows if you raise, if you bring attention to there's an issue out there, investors are particularly worried about the short-term consequences, the cost. The bottom line, we can't carry on doing business as usual. So in the context of conference calls, we expect the firms that stress that, they will talk more about that. They're the ones that will probably don't get a positive capital market reaction. So that's the first, the first prediction we have. The second one, though, is, again, the good news. But managers can use that opportunity 
and frame it, frame it in a positive way. Talk about opportunities, talking about why it's important to be a first mover, talking about the upside of being a leader, talking about how it affects them. I yeah, really like the internalization bit of it. Yeah? And then we, we argue, though, like if they frame it, there's always some sort of credibility issue. Yeah? Like the same with ESG data. We, we know that. Like what's out there, what we see as data, we don't really know is that, is that a true reflection of reality. So if companies now say, in a positive way, like here's something great about our environmental performance. Is this a credible signal? And we argue there are basically two, two ways how, how um, investors are likely to verify the credibility of the signal. The first one is the issue-related performance. So how do data providers, in our case, we, we focus on KLD, how would they assess the company? So basically looking at if a company is doing really well on their environmental performance and they just speak positively about it, will that have the similar influence on investors' perception versus a company that does not do well and still frames it positively? Would still say, maybe we're not doing great, but here's what we want to do and here's why we want to change and here how it helps you as an investor that we want to change. And then the second one, because we know the future is uncertain, so it's like how the trajectory will be with the environmental impact, talking about floods, talking about heat. We don't really know. We, we sort of have an idea how it will affect companies. We know it will affect them, but to what extent, when? There's a lot of uncertainty. So do managers incorporate that uncertainty in their language is our fourth hypothesis because we expect to send a credible signal. You need to acknowledge that uncertainty. Okay, data and methods. We look at... a big set of, of textual documents. We focus on conference calls. Um, that's that's prim primarily driven by my personal excitement about that, that setting because it's one of the few areas where you can observe for companies a back and forth conversation with sell side analysts about what they currently just put out there is the message. Yeah? So we, we don't talk about a tax document that's, that's somewhere available and you don't need to to be worried about an immediate challenging of that. But in earnings conference calls, you have tough Q&As. If managers send out a certain message, they can be sure if that message is not credible, they will be challenged by, by analysts. So um, that's why we, we focus on, on earnings conference calls. We particularly focus on, on the scripted section of it, yeah, the management discussion, because we want to see what's the initial frame they put out there. And then we look at um, how the capital market reacts to it. We do a lot of additional analysis. I won't bore you with the uh, empirical details, but we, we did a lot to verify the... Um, the, the robustness of our results, and again, a nice overlap with Shady. One of the identification strategies, we look at the abnormal heat around the headquarter as an exogenous factor. Like, what happens if there is a heat event, let's say it's very hot around the conference school, does it actually change how they frame? This is something they, uh, where, they, where they would change their disclosures, and, and we do find evidence for that. So, so again, really nice to see that um, we... We have never, never met before, but nice to see, really, that, that we think about those things similarly. So there is an importance for uh, considering how external factors are increasingly becoming internalized. Um, so what we do is we, methodologically, we use um, regular expressions. Basically, what we do is we want to tease the sentences where they would talk about the environment uh, versus from those where they would not talk about the environment. So basically, the idea is it's... it's Compared to what, what you described before, also what other studies do, I would basically describe our methodology as a rather simpler approach, but it is, it's a clear, regular expression. Do they talk, in a sense, about the environment or not? And then we look how they frame it, because um, for the context of earnings conference calls, um, there is a lot of evidence that simple methods often even work better than, than rather complex. And that's, I think, uh, also what you, what you uh, described before. So, so it's a nice, uh, I mean, a nice takeaway for practice, a nice takeaway for other researchers. Don't start with an overly complicated model. Start simple and then benchmark it. And then you realize, oftentimes, the simple approach might work as good or even better. You know? So that's why you use uh, word approaches. We have four different uh, word lists. So the environmental sustainability is basically how we tease um, the, the general speech from the specific talk about the environment, and then we benchmark, then we look at how do they talk specifically about the environment. We have three uh, framing-related um, word lists. We have a positive and negative words. Again, would they rather talk positively about the environment? Would they talk about chances, upside, growth opportunities? Or would they talk negatively about it? Would they talk about risk? Would they talk about decrease in profitability? And then lastly, the uncertainty, again, looking at the credibility of the signal, would they provide a specific number, specific message, or would they say it is likely that something will happen, it is probable, it is possible? So, so those are our, um, our word list. And um, just to, to show you what, what, it's, what it looks like in reality, so, so here's a, a speech extraction from a conference call um, where we have basically two sentences 
on uh, renewable projects, and we see they use two different frames here. They would, one, talk about the uncertainty of it, yeah? where they talk about anticipation, where they benchmark reality with, um, with anticipations. And then, um, here they would talk about the benefits of a renewable project, yeah? a positive frame. So now the question is, what do we find? So here are the empirical results, and I keep the, the slides just here for a few seconds. So you know, we, we do have some uh, econometrical uh, results, but I'd rather want to show you the big picture. What do we find? Because I think that's, that's the key, uh, key bit to it. So first of all, we do find the more you talk about it initially, the more negative will be the reaction. And it does make sense because um, investors are primarily worried about the short-term impacts of, of the need to change. Second of all, and here's the good news, if you frame it positively, that is where it really helps you. Yeah? So um, it's important to talk about it. And increasingly, so that's what stakeholders expect. Yeah, there's, there's no way to, to avoid talking about carbon. There's no way to, to avoid talking about regulatory changes. But then what really matters, what we find is the way how you frame it matters. We find there is a positive effect of, of tone. And we find in line with prediction, acknowledging that uncertainty in that language even strengthens that relationship. So talk about it in a positive way. Talk about the upsides and then acknowledge that it's still uncertain what exactly will happen because that verifies, that gives credibility to your signal. What we do not find is that the actual environmental performance matters as we predicted. And I want to show you that um, as, as a quick graph and because what we see, the companies that do really well, yeah, that's basically the right hand side outside the blue box, it does not matter how they frame it because the capital market already knows they're doing really well. Strong signal, there's, there's no need to, to verify with language what they're doing. The, the industry peers, everybody sort of like sees them, what, what they're really doing. Where we find a re significant results is really in the middle, where it's unclear, where we have a lot of data ambiguity. Yeah, like we were talking earlier, um, earlier today about how different the data out there are, like uh, the, the low correlation between different ESG data providers. In one, one data set, they might, be, they might be sort of like in the middle, the other one, the bottom, the top. So where there's ambiguity in the data, language really matters. And that's where we find it helps to talk about it. Yeah? So that's, that's our key takeaway here. Um, when there's a lot of data ambiguity, make sure to frame it appropriately. Make sure to talk about the upsides. Um, yeah, so again, contributions, talking about why, why is it important? Strategic change, language is important. Yeah, so it's important how you frame when you want to garner capital market supports. You need to think about consciously about your language. Second of all, uh, when we talk about uh, positive frames on a topic that's by definition uncertain, make sure to send that credible signal. And then lastly, when we think about a transition becoming more sustainable, stronger to, to like, get the capital markets to, to acknowledge the importance of ESG, there is an upside. It's, it's not about the us versus capital markets. It's about getting support by capital markets by using language for that. So um, with those uh, final remarks, I'm uh, very grateful for uh, having the opportunity to present and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. So we kind of blew all 10 minutes, but it was, I'm sure you heard the passion in all of them. So I thought it was worth it. Um, we're going to move to Q&A, and I want to start immediately by asking if you have questions, please raise your hand. I'm told that uh, the room carries uh, the voice. You don't need a microphone, so please raise your hand if there are any questions. Otherwise, I do have a few questions for all of you. Yes? Um, so I actually have a question for Sebastian. Um, so you, you speak about sort of positive negative topics and the uncertainty around it and the way um, this all can be framed. Um, but you potentially consciously um, stay away very clearly from, from the issue of greenwashing. So I was wondering to what extent um, that plays into this whole discussion. So to what extent can you actually pick up on firms actively trying to misrepresent what they are doing or to exaggerate their green credentials? Because um, that, that's in a way it's, it's, a, it's a form of maybe inaccurate framing. Um, and, and, and it's a big issue out there. So to what extent can your results shed any I mean, th that's a great, uh, great question. And um, the, the question of are companies uh, good or bad with, in terms of their environmental uh, sustainability is something where I think earnings conference calls are important because um, what, what we observe is companies that actually do not do too well on their environmental performance, they would often don't really talk about their current performance. They would rather talk about the future. They want to send out their, like, they, without even explicitly acknowledging we're doing bad stuff, they're like, here's what we're going to do. So I, I think, um, so, so really to, to your 
question about greenwashing. I think um, conference calls are not really the ideal setting to to look at greenwashing, but it's rather about how would um, good versus bad performers communicate perhaps differently. And what we see is really um, the ones that don't do too well and, and say we want to improve. We, we do see the capital market rewards that because they see, okay, there's, there's definitely, I mean, the, there's now the understanding that if you do really, really poorly, there are opportunity, um, opportunity um, out there where you can really um, increase your, perform your financial performance. Maybe I'd like to bounce the question to Shadi and Professor Court because it's very related. If you cannot pick up greenwashing in earnings call, can you pick it up through their disclosed documents? Yeah, actually, I wanted to jump in because uh, I find it interesting. If we use the set of companies that we believe have internalization in place, but we, when we zeroed in on the discussions where they have internalization pathways, we see that these companies discuss kind of their operations with respect to past and present and future performance, and they track the operations and their sustainability goals. So we saw a lot of kind of comparison of what did we do in the past and how is kind of how is this going to change versus when we didn't see these internalizations. As Sebastian said, we saw a lot of, so we have to have innovative solutions in the future without personalizing it towards company operations. Yes. Greenwashing or positive spin, which is very related, um, is a management method to prevent internal data. Right? If it is a reputational issue, um, then a positive spin on an earnings call or even an outright lie is a way to prevent the internalization onto the business. And then there's a parallel internalization, which is we got caught. Um, so what's interesting to me is you know how we're, we're coalescing around the idea that you know, greenwashing is an effective strategy as long as you don't get caught. But what the, the, what the NFP needs to track is at what point will we catch you? Um, and can we track that kind of internalization pathway as well? Because that will, I think that is the, the, the key where humans will never be able to you know, do this. But machines, I think, will start to be able to see through and say, this has gone too far. We can, we can demonstrate that what you have said is not you know, true, and therefore the risk of the second internalization pathway is becoming manifest. Um, that's where I think it's very interesting and where I think how this goes next. Uh, but you know, but I, I, I don't want to greenwash greenwashing. <laughs> I mean, perhaps like uh, just just to add to that point, I guess the, a key challenge when we talk about detecting greenwashing and we say like, is this a good or a bad performer? We, we haven't even reached a consensus about what is a good performance for a lot of the metrics, right? So we haven't reached a consensus on certain definitions. So if a company says we're good on topic X and we don't agree on what topic X is, we can't really say that's greenwashing, right? So, so I, there's a lot of importance about like thinking about language, thinking about definitions. So, so here we really look at how we can identify things, but it's, there's a lot that needs to happen um, at the front stage of can we find a consensus about what is a good performance? What do we, what's the context of a certain topic that then eventually gets internalized within a company? Um, I, if I can add more on this, uh, because it's a very good example of how technology also can assist on this, and I think they are all, all, all of them right. Um, you know, for example, regulators are working on the definition of greenwashing, not only on the definition of the performance, but on the definition of greenwashing. So ISMA is working, like the, 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 the joint supervisory authorities, asking the industry, what do you, where do you see greenwashing? Okay? So a little bit of whistleblowing. You know, let's say you yourself, what do you see when, uh, greenwashing in your peers? At the same time, the in, uh, academic work is doing exactly what you said. And they are trying to use not only earning calls, but all the possible documents that the company are filling uh, to really try to see where they are cherry picking the words that they are using, because we are at the point that they can reverse engineer the optimal strategy, again, using NLP. So I just recommend, I don't want to sell the, uh, the research of others, but Climate Bird, it's actually training Google Bird exactly to pinpoint where are they using selected words for greenwashing. So actually NLP is trying to work in parallel to what the regulators are doing, trying to do the same. And they are just trying to help investors decide based on, on, on this possibility. There, yes, please go ahead. Yes, hi, I think to the topic of both greenwashing and management quality, 
do any of your studies or your work look at other data sets beyond looking for the, the words and, and specific topics that you mentioned to help get to that? So for example, a management team that perhaps has a track record of misguiding on earnings or missing earnings estimates, poor capital allocation, a history of involvement in controversies, be they ESG related or not, is there any way that those data sets can also help support a potential be of greenwashing and or management quality? And I'm thinking of them somewhat synonymously. It's a question for Andres, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I was, at the same time you were speaking, I was trying to remember the names of some of the research, but actually they are doing. I would say at least I would, I would like to say the technology is alternative data, and we have a lot of discussion about the discrepancies of the ESG ratings and where do, can we see some greenwashing in the sense that we do not, do not have the best available information, or at least that we do not know because there are discrepancies of what different people tell us about the same, in, the same company. Uh, so NLP is helping there. There is a good research called Climate Q&A &Q that actually they are trying to do more or less what you say. They are trying to put uh, alternative data, web scrapping, pieces of news, everything together, and you can ask what is your opinion about which is the best uh, available ESG rating on this company based on your data. So they are trying to do more or less what you say, I think, is using alternative data. Um, to the top of my mind, I, I would say that. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, not, not so much in this project, but um, in another project, I look at policies on specific topics. Would Basically, the question, if company put out a policy on, a, on human rights or a specific issue on uh, human rights, is that something like, is that a credible signal to, to the couple market that companies are aware of that? And, and basically, the expectation would be, if there's a policy out there, the likelihood that the firm will have a serious issue, like a human rights litigation, should be, should be lower. But what we do find um, is it really depends on the topic. Certain, as, in certain, uh, on certain topics, um, the relationship is, is positive. So we even find if there's a policy out there, the likelihood will be higher for the firm to have a litigation case. And that might simply, and might, um, with that, there are like two possible explanations. So I'm not saying it's either of the two. Like that's, that's where we're currently working on. But um, the, the tension there is really, is that greenwashing? It could be. It could just be really boilerplate language signaling we are doing something, or it's something the firm knows. We need to work on it. We need to change. That's why we put out a policy in the first place. So, so that's really, so that's why I think it's super important to look at um, other disclosure sources, other materials out there, because they will guide sort of like the, the initial um, discussion. And then I think really figuring out, is it green sourcing or not? It can't be answered with a single data source. That's my personal belief. You, you really need to, to sort of like get your puzzle together, look for different clues, like um, how would they talk about it in, in one disclosure setting versus in another, and then come up with your assessment of it. So maybe I'd like to emphasize on those points, because the three of you in your papers used the word credibility multiple times, questioning credibility or climate data. So we're all into picking words at this stage. And I just wanted you to comment on how do we improve, what is your perception based on your research? How do we improve on the credibility of disclosure or the credibility of um, the messaging in the earnings call, the credibility towards your stakeholders, your regulators, to avoid claims on greenwashing. What is your perception based on the research that you have done on what can we do to improve credibility? Maybe I'll start with Professor Court. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but that's, that's, the way, that's the other way to look at it. 
So I'm going to go to the two of you in a minute, but it sounds like basically the path forward for climate finance to make progress is to encourage through technology the use of multiple source of data, multiple uh, types of information and cross-reference them. Is that a fair statement? Yes, super fair. Just want to put examples on the table. When we said, I, I do agree a lot, uh, uh, first is regulation. Regulation will need technology. It's machine-readable data. And IFRS is working on XBRL format. So we want to, to, we need technology also to put this standardization. It's not only about, you know, uh, putting their own table. It has to be readable automatically. Uh, and second thing, it's, I would add one more you know, I, I do agree with uh, the public exposure, and the public exposure will, will arrange themselves to find who is lying here, but also the private market, market can help here. And I'm thinking about auditing this information. Nobody is still talking about auditors, and everybody knows about financial auditors, but not about climate finance or climate data auditors. And there again, technology can help. And we are starting to see things like, um, Spatial data sounds like uh, rocket science, but I mean using satellites to really try to compare the reported data to what I can estimate using my satellites, try to verify. We need kind of validation, an external party here validating the information. I again, that will be here together with technology. Uh, in the previous session, they talked uh, also about digital twins and the like. So I'm thinking about some kind of those technology that can help also to validate the data. And I think that there are private solutions, fintechs or uh, startups that are trying to do that, uh, that thing. Just, just compare the information you received with this other information that you can uh, use yourself uh, mm -hmm. using the technology. So go ahead, yes. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I would like to extend on, on, on Todd's path down, down towards regulation and um, sort of like um, extending the, the point on why, why it's important, but then also sort of like emphasizing the limitations of it. So, so I think what, what, we, what we really need is external verification. We, we really need, and then extending to, to Andres as well, we really need assurance of sustainability data um, to, to a certain extent, like not like perhaps how it's happening within the EU now, like at a, at a high pace, but really thinking about what's realistic for, for smaller companies, right? Because for the larger ones, they're, they're mainly there, but when we talk about smaller companies, that needs to happen at a realistic pace. You can't expect them to basically from, go from zero to 100. So, um, so, so the, the, the scope and, and, and basically designing that, that path of regulation will be very critical, thinking about meaningful steps and, and maybe even differentiating between, across the resources, the sizes of, of, of the firms. Um, and, I, and I think sort of like that the goal should really be ultimately to get to the same rigor on non-financial disclosures as we have it for financial disclosures. So if we see a certain number, we know what the number means and we know that number with a reasonable likelihood is, is correct. Yeah? So, so not materially, uh, materially wrong. And um, talking about the, the limitation though is um, what what, what I often observe when I, when I talk to, to industry is um, a key challenge. It's, it's not about firms not wanting to, to, to provide good um, non-financial disclosures, sustainability disclosures. It's often a lack of ability, a lack of skills, a lack of corporate culture. Um, there's often still that sort of like that silo thinking about here's the financial guys, here's the non-financial guys, and they wouldn't be really integrated. So um, they're, often, they're often completely separated. And then what, what often happens when they start initially talking about sustainability assurance one of the first key steps would be they would actually the issue provider would just bring them together and they would talk about and the financial and the non-financial people would start to learn what 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 does it mean to provide rigorous disclosures how like how do I need to work with my documents how do I ensure across my and that's another thing when we talk about complex organization down the supply chain how do I make sure what I measure in my supply chain and let's say in South America versus Africa matches what I measure in, 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 in Asia within the same organization yeah? so it's not only about uh, regulation it's really then about how it gets implemented with in the organization, and I, I think that's a key challenge, and that, that it won't happen from today to tomorrow, but I think that's a key area where, where regulators and firm alike will need to work on. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. As a follow-up question to that, so you, when you look at the results from your modeling, I would include you in this as well, Shady, I'm curious if you see differentiation between types of industry or scope of the business, for the point that you just made, because clearly very large see those trends being represented in the data? 
on that, I can only add on the question. So this, I should be answering, but I, I, I can only add on that question. And I think that Corinne, even we discussed this before. Um, and, and, and the concern from my side is that you are absolutely right. And this, I, I would add that this might be biasing the decisions of some responsible investors or people trying to follow ESG principles, because we only have partial information, and that partial information may be biasing my, my decision. Although I try to do something good, uh, as I do not have the holistic view of all the market, uh, maybe ex post I might find that I didn't do the correct thing. And if I put myself on the feet of the CEO or, or the Q&A of the earning call, I, I see that portion of uncertainty as fair because you don't have the full view. So uncertainty has to also play a role here, and that's where regulators play a role. Uh, and, and the commitment from the politicians and, and from above, we have to say, you know, at least let's do it slowly, but let's do it at sectoral level. So it also makes sense not to stop, you know, the paralysis of the analysis, not to stop until you're very much happy with the data, super robust, robust, etc. You need to do something. But the concern is there. I share that concern. And at micro level, people may be having biased decisions. I, I see the problem. I, I'm not yet <laughs> here with the solution, but, but we cannot stop. It's the only message I, I would like to say. Maybe if I could add, at COP27 last week, there was a recorded session with the ISSB. So you may want to listen to it. It's free and public, uh, where they compared by industry companies providing disclosure on their climate risk. And um, you will see that very few people do provide uh, deep disclosures on their climate risk. But those companies that do um, tend to belong to certain industries. Yeah. I'll let you watch the recording. Um, yeah. Just a small addition, like a key factor that we see when it comes to conference calls. It's often the CEO. You have a new CEO. A lot of things change. Yeah, so it's, it's a lot about, like again, pos sending positive messages here about the research, what will we find, like, when you, when you change the tone at the top, a lot of things will trickle down. It's, it's a lot about um, how, you, how you start. Like, it's not necessarily immediately what actions do you take, but what, what, what is your agenda? Like, do you put yourself out there and say, we want to get better at a certain thing? Thank you. I know we only have 10 minutes left. Um, and I wanted to ask the three of you what uh, areas of further research to continue the progress in your respective fields um, are you anticipating? Shadi, maybe I should start with you. What do you think is the next step in the research that you conducted? Um, so I think for us, the, one of the clear next steps is that we found a kind of relationship between climate and management quality. And we think that lets us know what kind of financial implications that has. Um, the next step is to actually quantify the financial implications. Um, but I think also there is a lot of opportunities in the area um, so I think to your question, we use sustainability and annual reports that are kind of non-conventional sources of data because we think here we have these metrics, but what we think is missing is the nuances of how these interact with the operations. So I think um, investors, uh, companies sh in, can, shouldn't be dissuaded because of the lack of data. There are these ways of generating data to find out where we should look. And also, I think the emphasis that there are NLP tools that are black boxes, which is why we use this thematic representation that investors can actually look at and see, represent kind of what their documents are about. But also researchers, I think it's important to kind of use these approaches to find best practices, as I mentioned, in the industry to find, for example, in the section of the document that I represented, we found I don't know how to even pronounce polyhalite, which is a natural mineral fertilizer, and we found kind of a sequence of internalizations related to this company that we didn't even know about area of operations of this specific project, for example, in England. And um, researchers, I think it's uh, a lot of efforts could be placed into finding and placing these internalization pathways and filling in these kind of hidden um, variables and to kind of reverse engineer best practices. What should we do in the industry? What should we be looking at mm. in the next few years? Excellent. Thank you. Seb. Yeah, I think um, like what, what we currently are actually working on uh, really mirrors uh, nicely like the questions you had, uh, the focus of the discussion about the credibility. So um, what we, what we want to 
do is we want to better understand um, stakeholder congruence basically as a as a credibility signal. So looking at does what the company puts out there with with uh, like the management disclosures does it capture basically what what the own employees of a company talk about when they review their own company um, because that's that's a nice thing about like um, technology advancement we, we can basically get a nice view inside the company by uh, looking at like uh, glass reviews um, what how would they positively talk about the company how would they negatively talk about the company do they talk about impact in a positive way do they talk about certain risks do they do they actually acknowledge oh we our supply chain there's some issues or we're not doing enough about topic XYZ um, and is that something where the couple market looks at that as well like do they benchmark uh, the management with its own employees. Um, so that's what we're working on. And again, I think it's another important piece when you talk about credibility. Does that what's been set at the top reflect what's been uh, there with an old body of the organization? Thank you. Um, I, would, I would like to put as example our work in the BIA's Innovation Hub. Um, you know that there are all the central banks are working on what we find more uh, potential in the future and in green finance uh, there is a uh, one place where we are participating together with the Bundesbank of Germany that it's uh, exactly to extract uh, information using NLP for a very big universe of corporates trying to make that a public good as we are also uh, discussing that you know there are so many private providers and are, and are putting on the table very different information we try to put it in an open source uh, using NLP, but I do not want to forget about the validation and the external uh, assurance of the data where technology will play a very big role. Uh, I'm super optimistic about the spatial finance uh, and how satellites can, can play a role here. The European Space Agency, for example, is having a commercialization of their data sets and they are specifically looking for one work stream on green finance. So uh, startups are already applying to the ESA, to e ESA on how do I can add value using your data. So to me, that's a, a very, very good new research that is going to happen there. And, and thirdly, because it's always the trade-off, uh, we are using AI-driven technology, we are using machine learning, but we, we should put on the table also some responsible way of using this technology because the carbon foot, footprint itself of the technology is important. So never forget about that. It's also, uh, to me, quite important regarding future research. And Google, for example, is playing a big role in, uh, there. Thank you. Any more questions from the room? Yes. Uh, for those of us who are less um, sophisticated in, in this space, I'm just curious if you can give us an, an assessment. How far away are we from having this technology at scale be able to give us you know, kind of better assessments of quality management? This sounds very exciting, but is this coming in? Five years, two years, just kind of a sense as to how far we are from giving this. I, I have to put a number. <laughs> That's tough. But, but actual people are working on, on that. And they, we, we talk from, from time to time with the European Space Agency. And they are trying to put on the place an API for the researchers to try to uh, crowdsource their data and to have it uh, open and, and publicly available. And not the very best resolution of the images is available for free, but quite, quite reasonable quality of the images is already available, and people are already using that. So people here today in other sessions are working also with Ben Caldecott from the University of Oxford, and he's already using that. So uh, pe people are already at the academic level working on this, uh, the European Space Agency with the Copernicus satellites sounds like rocket science, but it's rocket science uh, landed to the Earth. Are starting to work on that. And auditors are already trying to work out uh, information from the satellites because we have another industry that really have worked with that, that is the insurance industry. They really work with this kind of images for these catastrophes, events, and estimation of this kind of uh, uh, extreme hazards. Um, so I would say that it's a matter of in the horizon of three years, uh, to really start to see things. For example, Planet Labs is a fintech, but has gone public uh, uh, in the equity market. Uh, Planet Labs is huge, and it's only doing this. Uh, so I invite you to look into these kind of companies, or Climate Trace. Climate Trace is, again, so much awarded, and they are trying to put a digital twin of the Earth so that you can yourself look into the data of per country, the emissions that they estimate. If you are a portfolio manager and you have sovereign bonds, you can try to compare the data. 
And, and it's very interesting because you see differences per sector, per country, so you can try uh, to make out your own idea of who is making it right and wrong. Do I trust more the reported data or the technology? That's another discussion. But I have names in my mind that people are trying to commercialize with this, so uh, it's quite close. Maybe we need to make a distinction between the technology that's here today and the fact that the technology creates data that's not here today, yeah. right? So the data is not here, but is, is growing exponentially, and all of this research is cross-pollinating and accelerating progress. So whether we will have it in two or three years or whether next, week, next year at the conference we will talk about the data. Yeah. Perhaps just to, to reemphasize uh, Andre's positive view, I, th I think it'll happen quickly and it'll hip happen quicker than we think because um, the nice thing about it is it's not, not only something we, we need for predicting um, non-financial performance, non-financial issues, but if you even think like the, the core business, um, you, you can use that data uh, really well to, to make predictions before you see things in the financial statements, before you see um, changes in your customer behavior. So uh, just as an example, what, what's been already out there for uh, as a trading strategy on uh, retail companies is where they would look at satellite images on the parking lots of, of supermarkets. So um, that data is out there. It's, it's been used. So I think it's just a matter of time really finding the, the right angle to use it in a non-financial sphere. Is there another question? Excellent. So I really have to stop. Thank you so much for your participation today. <laughs>